Okay, so we are being recorded now. Uh, okay, so well, it's a pleasure to have Nico from the University of Waterloo speak about traces on locally compact groups. So please, Nico, go ahead and start at any moment. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I want to thank in particular uh, David, who is my uh, inviter. So but I want to thank everyone for being here on this pleasant afternoon. Um, all right, so the work I'm talking on is, is joint work with Brian Forrest, who is my colleague at the University of Waterloo. Matthew Wiersma was our former student here at the University of Waterloo. Um, he has since been a postdoc both at the University of Alberta and uh, University of California, San Diego. And I'm very pleased to announce that uh, as of uh, the summer, he started his full-time position at the University of Winnipeg in Manitoba. So. Um, all right, so let me begin. Okay, so um, although the sort of background somehow underlying what I'm talking about is, is really in some sense a, a natural C star algebra problem, due in part perhaps maybe to my own prejudices, I like to take a somewhat function theoretic view to, to traces. So uh, I'll sort of explain this on, on the next slide, but just bear with me for the moment. So let us begin with a topological group. So I'm gonna to refer to a function as positive definite if, if given any finite selection for you know, any size of finiteness of elements from G, um, the matrix sort of made up by, by taking U of, of SI, SJ inverse or vice versa is, is positive semi-definite. So that's what's called a positive definite function. Uh, notice in particular, this is well known to anyone who's ever looked at this before. If I take this two by two matrix with, um, I guess an element um, uh, S and E, what it ends up showing is that these are automatically bounded. So the boundedness comes for free. So the basic spaces that, that sort of punctuate how I'll be talking about things would be just P of G, which is the the positive definite functions, which are continuous, a fortiori bounded. Um, P1 of G will be the ones that are normalized to one. And then the traces are the ones satisfying this particular uh, trace condition here. Okay, uh, let us sort of bring the C star algebras into play. Now, for the most part, I'll be interested in, in locally compact groups. So locally compact group admits, um, uh, har measure, I'll take the left har measure always. And hence I get some nice sort of involutive algebras with this sort of usual convolution and this sort of usual involution. This delta only shows up if I'm not unimodular. Um, you know, many semi-direct product groups will fail unimodularity, but most things we know and like, in fact, this will be a trivial function one all the time. And um, so this being an involutive algebra, uh, due to a variety of perspectives, it has a universal C star algebra. But remember for, for a locally compact group, this is not necessarily unital. It's unital only if G is discrete. So what it's really coming from is a completion of either of my favorite variations of these convolution algebras completed with respect to the largest C star norm. So this is my universal C star algebra. Okay, so furthermore, we have a sort of uh, really important representation, this left regular representation. I kind of, again, like the sort of integral form, the left regular representation on a sort of L2 element is just convolving in some reasonable sense. And in fact, this particular thing here ensures that this is in fact a norm, that it's not just some sort of semi-norm by which I have to mod out a kernel or something strange like that. Okay. And then there's a sort of canonical identification, which I'll just sort of quote here, in that um, if I look at, for example, my, my, my normalized positive definite functions, this is exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with the state space of this, this universal C star algebra. And, and for integrable elements F, the sort of dense subset um, that helps to build the C star algebra, the duality is witnessed exactly thusly. So keep in mind, of course, if um, I was a discrete group, maybe I'd focus on C, C of G being the finitely supported functions, usual convolution, usual inverse convolution, really just arising from an interpretation of the group ring. 
and this would be completing the group with. So this is, I'd say really just a generalization of that. And then it's pretty easy to check once one has this, one can just use a little bit of, I don't know, invariance of the integral and whatever. And we find out that these, 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 these traces, so I remind you the traces have this particular condition here, that the variables commute inside. Well, that corresponds to the tracial states on the dense set of the L1 elements, for example, and therefore on the entire C star algebra. So what I'm really talking about is tracial states on a C star algebra, but I'm using this sort of function theoretic description. Um, some other ones that will come up in due course have to do with the reduced C star algebra. So again, we have our distinguished left regular representation and closing it up amongst the bounded operators on the L2 space gives me the reduced C star algebra. And if I look at just the, the matrix coefficients associated with the left regular representation, this is a nice family of positive definite functions. And it's actually quite rich. If I close this up with respect to the topology of uniform convergence on compact sets, then I get another nice family um, of positive definite functions. This is a subset possibly of the positive definite functions we've seen earlier, unless the group is amenable in which I've described everything. And of course, uh, this is really just the matrix coefficients of the representations that are weakly contained in the left regular. So then my reduced tracers are the ones associated with this left regular representation with a sort of appropriate closure therein. And just like before with the same sort of duality, the uh, normalized uh, reduced um, positive definites is the state space of the reduced C star algebra. And likewise, we get the, uh, the, the tracial states on there. Okay. Um, so let me just talk maybe briefly and, 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 and possibly too glibly about some stuff that's known about looking at traces. And, and I'll talk about more of the, the ambient background literature as I go on, but um, maybe just for a first blush, let's imagine that we have a, a discrete group. And I don't really know anything about this discrete group. I'm, I'm gonna assume it's infinite and, and probably non-amenable, but you know, don't necessarily need to assume that. Now we're assured at least two traces. The constant function one definitely satisfies this positive semi-definite type condition, but it's also easy to check that the indicator function at the identity subgroup uh, also satisfies that. It has this particular form that guarantees that I make these positive definite conditions. But I can do a little bit better. If I have a normal subgroup and I take the quasi regular representation, then likewise, the indicator function has this nice form and makes some traces. Furthermore, if the subgroup is amenable, there's the brackets. Well, then in fact, it's, it's even somehow forming a trace on the reduced C star algebra. Um, so there's an observation in, I guess, an archived paper of Robin Trucker Drob that. If, if we have an invariant random subgroup, which is, um, that'll be, so what I'm gonna do is I'll think of the subgroups of gamma as it turns out it's a closed subset of this space here, of this sort of power set space with the product topology. <clears throat> so if I have a, a probability measure on that set, which is invariant by a sort of very natural um, kind of duality to conjugating subgroups, then certainly I can, I can integrate the indicator functions um, over the support of that measure. And it helps me build some other trace on the group. Um, furthermore, if um, the support is um, amongst um, amenable um, such subgroups, then in fact, it's easy enough to check that this is in the uh, reduced traces. This is in fact, literally what uh, Robin did. So this is my asterisk condition. Turns out that actually the asterisk condition is pretty rigid. You don't really get a lot of invariant random subgroups unless you have some sort of non-trivial amenable, amenable radical. It turns out they all have to be contained in there. And that's, that's in fact a rather deep result. That's Bader, Duchesne, and uh, Le Carreau. Um, and in fact, um, 
as a consequence of this theorem I'm quoting at the bottom, this is Briad, Kalantar, Kennedy, Ozawa. Kennedy is my colleague here in Waterloo. Um, in fact, they, they, they do a lot of very deep stuff, um, including talking about simplicity of reduced C star algebras of discrete groups, but I'm just gonna focus on the tracial side. So one of the aspects of their paper is they, they can show that we get a unique reduced trace exactly when we get no non-trivial normal amenable subgroups. So I think this is, this is maybe uh, one of the most profound results in this area up to date, but uh, some more um, relatives of this result will come up in due time. Okay, so this is, I think, stuff that's known um, kind of largely in community of operator theorists, in particular people who are interested in traces and the like. Um, let me just be maybe in some sense just more blissfully naive and start looking in other directions for uh, possible traces. So for example, um, if I'm an abelian group, then, um, well, the, the commutivity condition in the variable comes for free. So all of my norm one positive definites are traces. And then if we use um, Bachner's theorem, well, that's just the probability measures on the dual group. So there's lots of traces. There's, there's just no shortage whatsoever. And, and maybe somewhat um, in a sort of similar vein uh, for, for, for a compact group, your sort of essential traces are these normalized characters, right? My, my finite dimensional representation, my, my irreducible representations are finite dimensional. The character is the trace and I'll normalize it. So I've normalized my traces. And uh, in fact, it's easy to see that the, the closed convex hull, which I guess in some sense is a, you know, the L1 type convex combinations of these types of things here, describes all the traces I could ever see. So I'll consider these cases sort of somewhat easy to understand. And of course, these are amenable type cases. These would be reduced cases, traces as well. Oops, let's go back. Um, okay. And uh, so one can notice, just from what I've said here, there's gonna be really a richness of traces in, in sort of any event where I get infinitely many finite dimensional or finite dimensional irreducible unitary representations, say in particular, if G mod its commutator is infinite. So, you know, these are the types of situations when can we expect a sort of richness of traces, other times um, possibly quite less so. So this sort of helps us to think about what types of things we might uh, strive to look for. So let me um, start on the next slide with a result that really lied in the background of my two slides ago, that um, these sort of norm one, these normalized positive definite functions um, have a sort of canonical G and S type form. That, that one can always build a, a suitably continuous representation, unitary representation for which this is a matrix coefficient. Uh, so that's a, a very standard result. The, the next proposition I think is, is known quite well to specialists, but uh, worth noting all the same. So using uniform convexity of, of Hilbert spaces on which I've done um, my GNS construction, then it's easy to show that given a norm one positive definite function, that the, the elements that are taken to one by the function, well, these are exactly the elements for which pi u of s xc inner product with xc is one. Well, it's easy to show that that has to be a closed subgroup, that it's actually going to, um, well, satisfy the group laws, of course. Um, and then, just by adding the trace condition, this even becomes a normal subgroup. And it's, it's not too hard to check that a little bit furthermore, we have to fool around just a little bit. This is even exactly the kernel of the representation. Generally, um, this subgroup is larger than the kernel. Okay. Um, so using this observation too, that just simply that these are all normal subgroups at any rate, it, if I take, and they're closed evidently because these are continuous functions. So if I take this intersection of closed normal subgroups, I get a closed normal subgroup. That is something that I would refer to as the, the tracial kernel. And then 
if, if my goal, for example, is to try to say as much as possible about the sort of structure of what this trace family is, then the first reduction is, is that I would mod G out by this trace kernel, and I would actually be in effect simply dealing with representations of this quotient here. So if I wanted to understand traces, this is sufficient. So what this informs me, I guess, is that this is uh, at least going to help me say semi-intelligent things about what my traces might look like. Okay, so having introduced a kernel, um, there's, there's again a sort of other methods to start looking for traces that I'll get at in two or three slides. And this sort of invites a bunch of related kernels. All right, so um, this von Neumann kernel uh, is, is somewhat hinted at, I think, in terms of talking about these characters of finite dimensional representations a couple of slides back. So um, the maximally almost periodic groups are the ones that continuously embed into compact, well, not embed, but continuously inject into to compact groups or equivalently have a separating family of finite dimensional representations. So there's lots of nice ways of thinking about them. And this is actually a classical kernel from papers all the way back in the 1940s called the von Neumann kernel. But for a certain notational consistency, I'll think of it as the sort of maximally almost periodic kernel because um, I want to sort of think of these kernels in terms of certain definable classes of subgroups. Now, another kernel that we might come up with is we might look at all subgroups, normal, closed normal subgroups, so that G mod N has the small invariant neighborhood property. So there's a base of neighborhoods of the identity, uh, each invariant under conjugation, small invariant neighborhood property. And I'll take the intersection of those and I'll call this the small invariant neighborhood kernel. Sounds clumsy. Sadly, I, I don't think this has occurred in the literature before, but it's not a tricky thing to define. Um, so one thing that's extremely appealing about the von Neumann kernel is it somehow sort of distinguishes the largest quotient of a group, which is maximally almost periodic. That's not a deep or difficult exercise. Um, but here, here's kind of a curious thing. Uh, at first glance, you, you would love to hope somehow that G mod this, this sin kernel defines for us a small invariant neighborhood group. Um, but if you try to prove it, you'll fail for, for obvious reasons that I can show pretty soon examples of, of um, things where that's not the case. So, um, what I guess we really have to somehow observe is that if I take G modulo this kernel, it has a separating family of closed subgroups by which the quotient is small invariant neighborhood. So, well, let's just call that residually small invariant neighborhood. And, and that's actually uh, in, in broadest strokes, the best that we can hope for. And so this sort of invites us to, to sort of name a new class of groups that we might call the residually small invariant neighborhood subgroups. Okay, so there's sort of a danger in um, defining a new class in that, of course, maybe you're just doing something that's not very interesting, that doesn't sort of live in sort of any interesting manner relative to other classes. So, um, Here's the fact that that did take a little bit of trouble to prove, but, but is extremely satisfying. Turns out we can prove that this maximally almost periodic class is always a member of this residually small invariant neighborhood class. And, and this is somewhat of a significant thing to observe because uh, I'll show an example uh, quite shortly. There's famous examples from 70 years ago that maximally almost periodic groups are not automatically small invariant neighborhood, which is a little bit surprising because compact groups is the sort of first non-commutative class you'd ever think about that enjoy a small invariant neighborhood property. But, but um, sort of this, this compact injectability doesn't necessarily give us this. So uh, let me just be extremely vague about the idea of why this is true. It does involve some structure theory that goes back to the middle of the 20th century mainly the, the frudenthal weil theorem. So we end up kind of staring at, at the connected component of the identity 
And then we'll just fix some finite dimensional continuous unitary representation. And, and one ends up showing that there is a sort of open subgroup containing this uh, G naught that, that, well, kind of helps us to show that this, that G mod this kernel is a small invariant neighborhood group. Hence this kernel is n sin. And because we've assumed this is maximally almost periodic, there's enough of these to separate points. So we get this residually sin condition. And what's kind of cute is the technology of this proof tells us things that, um, well, I certainly didn't know before, but I, I do wonder if it's known already by group theory specialists. Um, so if I have a maximally almost periodic group that's totally disconnected, so that's the same as assuming that this connected component of the identity is is, is the trivial group, uh, then it turns out such a group is necessarily residually discrete. So it actually for free has a separating family of, um, of uh, well, I guess open normal subgroups that, that intersect to, to the identity or a separating family of discrete quotients. Now, if I add furthermore, maximally almost periodic, totally disconnected and compact generation, well, then we just get Molsev's theorem discrete groups that are compactly generated and maximally almost periodic are not just maximally almost periodic, they're residually finite. So uh, they're even a little bit stronger. Okay. Um, so these are sort of things that are related. So um, what this allows us to do is um, there's a sort of sequence of, uh, I guess this, this paper due to Theo Palmer based off of um, work of Grosser and Moskowitz and people like this, sort of trying to classify uh, classes of locally compact groups. So, you know, this is a bit modest, yes, but we can at least add one sort of class that, that's not considered by Palmer, which is this R sin class. Now, just for fun, I've added this residually compact class, but Nobody really considers that. I don't think it's that interesting, but I'm just putting it in here for completeness of diagram purposes. So the fact is, these are all distinct classes. There's compact groups, discrete groups, small invariant neighborhood groups, residually compact, maximally almost periodic, which is the same as residually maximally almost periodic and residually sin. So each arrow uh, is indicating that one class is, is, is contained in another. And then if I put a symbol above or below an arrow, I'm sort of indicating some kind of um, counterexample to the fact that the class, say on the right in this case, is more general than the class on the left. So I have these sort of nice familiar examples, all abelian groups. <coughs> okay, so what are some examples of things that are residually sin but not sin? Well, this is a, a class that I, I guess in my mind I think of as Japanese examples because um, one of the things that motivated an earlier version of this paper I did with um, Matthew Wiersma and Brian Forrest was a group, or at least a way of decomposing a certain group due to Suzuki. So here's a sort of very general construction. I'm going to take a discrete group. I'm going to take a finite group of automorphisms. But I want this finite group of automorphisms to contain an automorphism with infinite conjugacy classes in the group. So then we do the following construction. I'm going to do this direct sum of the group. So this is sort of like the direct product, but at any time I only have finitely many non-trivial entries on gamma. So I'll think of that as the direct sum. I'll treat this as a discrete group. And then I'll take the product of the finite groups, again, over the natural numbers, and the, each finite group of automorphisms acts pointwise on its sort of counterpart um, gamma. So the fact of the matter is, is if we insist on this infinite conjugacy class type condition, this will always produce a group that is residually small invariant neighborhood, but has a whole wealth of discrete um, quotients and, and therefore um, is residually discrete and therefore residually small invariant neighborhood. So this is sort of a, a class of these. And, and again, the first of these, is this example of, of Murakami. So this is a, um, in fact, a residually compact example, in particular, maximally almost periodic, but, but not small and very neighborhood. So I just take the simplest uh, infinite group I can, 
and the only non-trivial automorphism that's allowed. And then it turns out that that works. Um, but one can sort of make maybe um, stranger things. So I could take the discrete group of SL2 of the rationals. This is a countable, hence discrete group. Um, I'll just take an inner automorphism because I don't have any creativity for building automorphisms on matrix groups. And, but again, we satisfy this type of condition. And then I get something that's kind of interesting. I get something that's residually sin, but not sin. And it turns out this guy is not even maximally almost periodic. For, for the reason being, uh, von Neumann and Wigner showed that this group here does not have a separating family of, of um, I guess, compact quotients. So they showed literally that this is not a maximally almost periodic group. Okay. So, so just back to where I was. So we end up with these two related kernels, right? So we started with the, this kernel that comes from all of the traces. I got some kernel that comes from, you know, really the characters of the finite dimensional representations. But then I have this other thing that feels maybe a little bit disconnected from, from trying to talk about traces. Why do I sort of care about that other than perhaps somehow deeming small invariant neighborhood as a class that's a little bit bigger than um, compact groups? Okay, well, the reason for doing so is at least I now start getting a little bit of a language of discussion here. So we can show fairly easily that there's um, a containment of all of these kernels. So the trace kernel is the smallest of these types of kernels. There's the sin kernel and the map kernel. Well, this containment just follows from that, that theorem that's two slides ago, that every map group is our sin. So these kernels enjoy a containment. And then the reason I like sin groups, if you haven't intuited it already, is what I really wish to do is mimic this construction for building traces on discrete groups. So you recall on a discrete group, the indicator function of the identity um, is, is a trace. And uh, now the problem is, is if I'm, I'm like, I don't know, the real line or some other small invariant group, then I'm not really allowed to do that and retain continuity. But the small invariant neighborhood condition allows me to do something nearly as good. I get these sort of, um, these uh, invariant neighborhoods that are relatively compact, meaning they're compact. And uh, when we just sort of take, say, the left regular representation acting on one of these inner product the other, it's a fairly simple exercise to see that I get a trace. So this starts building me lots of traces once I can sort of um, put things in, in these small invariant neighborhood quotients. So, um, so this is really why this is true. This is sort of the first glimpse at how we might try to understand what our traces look like. Um, let me just list here as a question at the bottom of my slide, something that continues to needle me, even though I've been thinking about this for a couple of years. I have not discovered an example of a group for which this is a proper inclusion. Part of my gut tells me that maybe these kernels are always the same, but I am frankly uncertain of this. Uh, I just don't know. Um, so here's, here's one of the things that's sort of left open in, in the course of this discussion. However, if we go into a compactly generated world, then our life starts to get a lot simpler. Um, okay, so basically what this proposition is, is just a sort of squeezing to an almost maximal extent, a technique that I actually believed some years ago, I'd invented this, but not even close. This is 10 years before I'm born. Hoffman and Mostert pretty much figured out the same thing. So I don't think it's that hard an idea. But so essentially speaking, if I have a topological group and, and a family of open invariant subsets who intersect to the identity, and then I have a compactly generated group that admits a continuous injective homomorphism into H, that compactly generated group is necessarily small invariant neighborhood. All right, that's the technical statement of my proposition, but it's sort of um, in the language of what I want here tells me two things. But if I assume I'm compactly generated, then it's automatically true that my sin kernel and trace kernel coincide. And furthermore, if I'm compactly generated, then the residually sin condition implies the sin condition. So I, I can no longer distinguish residually sin from sin 
if I stay in a compactly generated world. So um, if I go back one bit here, I have this, this diagram of this sort of inclusion of classes. But of course, this arrow starts to eliminate right away. And furthermore, map maps into sin. So I get a really simple kind of uh, classification diagram if um, I'm going to stick in compactly generated world. So compact groups are compactly generated, but there are still, I guess, if you like, residually compact groups that are not. And there's one can even build with a small amount of effort a maximally almost periodic group that's not residually compact. I'm just using a three element rotation group acting on R2. And uh, I guess the most famous examples of um, discrete um, non maximally almost periodic groups are these sort of uh, bomb slag solitaire uh, class of groups. So this is actually a discrete class I'm giving as a counter example. Um, I'm trying to remember if I know of some nice um, totally disconnected examples, but I have none sort of at my fingertips. So I'll, I'll punt that and move on. All right, so now what we have here is that my trace kernel is, is equal to my small invariant neighborhood kernel in a compactly generated setting. Now, connectedness of a group implies compactly generated. But actually, um, the theorems of, of Frudenthal and Weil actually give us a little bit more. So it turns out if I'm compactly, if I'm, if I'm connected, then my small invariant neighborhood condition is equivalent to my maximally almost periodic condition. So it turns out I, I really can't see the difference between the two, but actually more is true. It turns out that amongst connected groups that satisfy one and hence either of these, they have a very simple structure formula, vector times compact, connected compact. So amongst connected groups, um, it's not very easy to be small and very in neighborhood. So, you know, if you're sitting around with your favorite matrix group trying to, you know, decide if the small invariant neighborhood class has any interest at all, you're, you're going to struggle unless your group's kind of trivial in some sense from this property's perspective. So uh, a nice consequence of this is amongst connected groups, the trace and the, and the von Neumann kernels coincide. And in fact, um, so, so Stern actually shows us how to find the von Neumann kernel of a connected Lie group. So what we end up with is we end up with something called the, 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 uh, the, the co-reductive radical. So we take the, the, the largest sort of, um, sort of solvable, well, Lie algebra and sort of do the sort of integral form of that. We get some sort of possibly not closed. Actually, I think this one's always closed. Yeah, we get some sort of a closed subgroup. And then you do these commutators, you get this thing called a co-reductive radical, whatever that is. And every time I get a solvable radical, I get a non-unique, but at least by conjugation, unique subgroup known as the Levy complement, which is semi-simple in the language of Lie groups. And then, then the, the Levy complement always sort of breaks up into two components that have um, a finite overlap sort of a compact component and a non-compact part of the Levy component. And again, these are essentially unique up to conjugation. Um, and that sort of allows us to figure out what this uh, von Neumann kernel looks like, hence the trace kernel. And then as a result, if I try to look at the quotient by the trace kernel, I mostly have enough information to tell me what to expect. Um, now you'd sort of like to hope that you could just glean everything right away from the data of our group, but actually in cases you always have to work it out. Um, but so essentially the, the, the V is a quotient of the maximal vector subgroup I'd find in G mod this co-reductive kernel. Um, and then um, turns out that uh, K is some sort of compact group. Some elements might come from there, but some elements also come from, um, this compact bit. Okay, so at any rate, in simply connected world, this is a really easy thing to use. Calculations come quite readily. Here's a slightly exotic example. Um, perhaps one's favorite um, non-simply connected and weird Lie group should be the, uh, the simply connected cover of SL2R. So it sort of covers SL2R but with, with um, integer many sheets. <clears throat> 
And it turns out that somehow each sheet is sort of identified by a central element. There's an isomorphism from integers into the center. And then one can do these sort of really strange non-matrix Lie group type constructions. And we can get things to become extremely strange. So maybe the whole uh, purpose of an example like this is to show that um, um, this quotient here can be actually in some sense quite a bit smaller than um, the vector part of, of, the, of G mod the co-reductive radical, which would actually look fundamentally like R times T, T being the circle group of the torus. All right, so this actually kind of knocks down exactly how we would expect things to, to look for any Lie group. And to some extent, we can do things for more general connected groups, but it's diminishing returns. So let me move to a, a sort of a different concept here, which is um, let's, let's look at the, the, the traces on the reduced C star algebras. Okay, so um, this is something that we figured out um, about four years ago or so, uh, Brian, Matthew, and, and I. <laughs> and uh, we were feeling very satisfied with this. <clears throat> so we showed for a compactly generated group that um, the existence of a reduced trace um, necessarily means, I guess through a little structure theory in retrospect, that there's some sort of um, amenable element um, amongst these co-sin subgroups. But then one can actually show that this means that G admits an open normal amenable subgroup. So we actually get a sort of co-discrete type guy. And, um, and then the trace kernel is itself um, amenable. And, and really sort of what underlies, say going for example from two to three is sort of a little lemma that actually looks for all intents and purposes like the way that one proves that a totally disconnected compact group is pro, pro finite. The, 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 the same essential idea. Is living in here. So um, the types of proof we have here do use a little bit of group structure theory, and I guess to some degree Hulaniski's theorem and things like that. But uh, this is a, a simple and very satisfactory proof. So we, we actually put this up on the archive, and it's it's gotten some citations. In fact, even Matt Kennedy told me he likes it because it says he thinks it sort of says a little bit more than something that he was able to prove. And, and notice that amongst compactly generated, like I said before, we naturally have the connected groups and hence we learn everything. The existence of a reduced trace is exactly when the underlying group is amenable. So we can learn this, you know, using quite old technology and, and fairly cheaply. So we figured this out in, in, in actually, I guess it was about 2016 or 2017, we figured this out and, and maybe we should have um, taken a walk down the hall because uh, my colleague, Matt Kennedy, who I feel no shame in being bettered by because I think he's an incredible mathematician. He was working with another incredible young mathematician, Sven Rahm, and, and using this technology of, of Kennedy Kalantar, um, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the terminology that's in here, but they had these sort of, uh, these sort of Poisson boundaries and things from dynamical systems. They, they, they really showed, a, I think, a really remarkable theorem so they showed that um, there exists a trace on the reduced C star algebra of a locally compact group exactly when the group admits an open amenable subgroup. And, and it turns out you can show without too much fuss that there's always a largest um, closed normal amenable subgroup that's called the amenable radical of G. So this would mean in fact that this amenable radical is, is open. Now they use a lot of heavy machinery, but in part they, they got something that if our, our thing doesn't even show us in the compactly generated realm. They actually showed us that the, the traces um, are all supported on this amenable radical. So really the traces on the amenable radical give us the totality of the traces on all of G, which, which I think is really quite nice. So, um, what it actually tells us is that um, if we want to understand the traces on G, what we really just do is we look at the amenable radical modulo of the trace kernel. The trace kernel will always live inside of there. 
and, and this sort of tells us what these traces will look like. Um, and, and this is in the case that G is amenable. So I probably should have said that in this slide. Okay, and the cute thing about this is it starts to give us some ability to leverage well-known results from the world of discrete groups and, and maybe uh, build what I thought was interesting, some examples of non-discrete groups which have unique trace on the reduced C star algebra. Now, of course, all of these examples I'm talking about here follow from this, this Kalantar, Kennedy, Briado, Zawa type theorem. But of course, you, we can see that some of these go way back, all the way to, uh, to uh, uh, Steve Powers' um, original discussion of traces on the reduced C-star algebra of free groups. Um, so let me just give a little smorgasbord here. Um, oh, so. Pardon me, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So let me just tell you a, uh, a couple of results we proved, one which I think is worthy of theoremness, and the other is quite a bit easier, so I called it a proposition. All right, so imagine we have the following data. I have a non-discrete abelian group A, and I have a finitely generated discrete group gamma, and gamma acts on A irreducibly. Um, we have to define irreducibly, but I think there's no surprises here. By acting irreducibly, I get no closed subgroups of A that are gamma invariant. That's what I mean by irreducible acting. Okay, so then when I look at the, the reduced trace kernel, so the, the things that are uh, one on all traces, then it turns out under this set of assumptions in my first line, the intersection with A is trivial one way or another. Those are the only two options that are possible. And in the case that it's small, so in the case that I sort of get lots of traces, that actually necessitates that this action of gamma on A factors through a compact group acting as automorphisms on A. Okay, so let me just give a little um, taste of, of why this is true. Um, okay, so if I have an ability for a discrete group to act irreducibly on A. This means that in particular, um, A has no, um, uh, what do you call it, hereditary subgroups. So in particular, it's either connected because the connected component of the identity is either the whole thing or trivial, or it's totally disconnected. And then once one witnesses that, we're in this compactly generated realm. All right, this compactly generated realm kind of makes me happy. It puts me back in this class where I could sort of understand what might happen because we, we had our theorem um, dealing with the sin groups. And then there's the sort of Askely theorem of Grosser and Moskowitz that tells us that um, if it's acting richly enough, it's somehow gonna factor through a compact group. Okay. Now, turns out, um, if I go into the case of a discrete group acting on a compact group, I don't need to be nearly as careful here. Life is a little bit easier. All I have to do is I have to say, all right, I'm acting on a compact group, therefore I act on the characters. And all I have to do is look at the possible size of, of, of orbits. So, um, and I can also sort of judge when, when this kernel is as big as K or not, and then, there's sort of more of a range of possibility allowed here. Um, now, of course, I've stated these uh, two results in terms of semi-direct products. If you sort of look through the machinery of the proof, I think they would work for all extensions, but I'm actually kind of lazy. I sort of prefer to build examples with semi-direct products. So let's just stay with that. And then this allows us to build all sorts of, um, maybe strange, maybe even surprising looking things with uh, unique. So by the way, two through five are going to have um, only one um, um, trace on the reduced C star algebra, whereas one and five allow many of them, as one might imagine. So for example, one, if I just let F2 act as a dense subgroup of SO3, well, then all the sort of, um, sort of radial um, invariant stuff is just fine for us. I think two is maybe the most interesting of these examples here. Um, 
So what's going on here is I have like a free group that I'll sort of abelianize. So Q is just my abelianization map. And then of course I can stick um, a free abelian group densely into the real line. And, and then if I sort of act on um, R2 by a sort of rotation matrix with sort of expansive type um, eigenvalues, um, I, I, I get something that, um, you know, has a certain type of, of, of uh, you know, I guess, I guess it's lacking a certain type of inner amenability and I get the sort of unique type trace condition. So this is all kind of fun. But so again, you know, I think now imagination is almost the limit of how one can play this out. Um, all right, so the point is, is there's all these sort of representative examples sort of using this weight of literature behind us that if I take a sort of discrete group I understand and act in a decent enough way on an abelian group, sometimes you can see I have to massage that a bit, I can get unique trace. And other times I might expect lots of them. Okay, uh, let me shift gears yet again. So um, now uh, there's, I guess, going all the way back, um, well, I guess really to, 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 to von Neumann, um, is this a sort of uh, ideas of, of what are now known, you know, maybe popularized in part by people like uh, Nate Brown, uh, meetable traces. I think Kirchberg, you know, worked with them quite a bit and called them liftable traces. Um, in terms of my definition structure, I'm going to just modify one of the theorems that's sort of well known um, to these sort of amenable traces and just put it in my function theoretic form and, and I'm going to do it in, in the following way. So in the sort of language of function theory, just to stay uh, nicely self-contained, I did a time check, I should move it along here. It's kind of fun to see that if I have a trace, then I'm, this two variable function sort of stays um, positive definite. And much like I had with reduced traces, I'm going to think of what are called these sort of minimal positive definite functions on the two element group, the sort of uniformly on compact closure of the, the, the smallest cone containing these sort of separated positive definite functions. Um, and in principle, I'm sort of making the state space on the minimal tensor product of these two universal C star algebras. So the amenable traces, um, for my context, I'll think of the ones that factor through there, and then I can make an associated kernel. Okay, um, let me sort of hurry up a little bit here because I realize I've costed myself a little bit of time. Um, so here's, here's some sort of interesting facts. In any event that my group C star algebra is nuclear, it turns out all of my traces are automatically amenable. Um, so then my trace kernel and my amenable trace kernel are one and the same, and I have sort of no reason to think of the difference. And as I quoted earlier amongst connected groups, or even it turns out sort of these almost connected groups, using sort of grosser Moskowitz's extension of fudenthal vial structure theory, um, I can show that, in fact, the, the traces, the trace kernel is the map kernel, and hence these kernels um, necessarily coincide. So um, modifying um, an idea that sort of goes to, really is in a paper of Ozawa and goes back to, to Kirchberg, is that amongst property T groups, it turns out that this type of inclusion here is necessarily an inequality. So property T is used in a fundamental way to prove this. And uh, this is true, of course, sometimes lacking property T as we can see above. But in fact, if we say go in certain discrete sort of, um, this is a, a solvable type, well, not solvable, but <clears throat> this type of group here is amenable. We can find amenable groups for which these two things are, are quite far apart. <clears throat> okay, so the factorization property of Kirchberg again deals with this family of min functions and coefficients of the so-called right, left, regular representation and so uh, part two, I think, is maybe the most compelling aspect of this theorem. It turns out that if I'm totally disconnected, 
and I know that this kernel is, is um, trivial, then I actually get Kirchberg's factorization property. Um, this is a little bit compelling because um, amongst either totally disconnected groups or almost connected groups, we know that this equality implies factorization. And then what we kind of wonder, is that gonna hold generally? And again, this is, I think the second sort of maybe interesting question that comes out of this entire talk. And uh, again, I have no res resolution for that at the moment. Um, let me do one last slide of content, which is just to advertise that um, if you recall amongst discrete groups, Lance showed um, nearly 50 years ago that amongst discrete groups, nuclearity of the reduced C star algebra um, characterizes amenability of the group. But you know, we know for many reasons that amongst say connected groups or whatever, lots of these C star algebras are nuclear. So no longer uh, is such a sort of rudimentary statement possible, but a very satisfying description came from a paper about six years ago of CK Ng that if you have a trace on the reduced C star algebra and it's nuclear, that is enough to give amenability and hence, and of course, vice versa. Well, we have a sort of um, an alternate, maybe arguably easier proof than Ng does of his results. And ours just runs through the amenable reduced traces and is essentially given thusly. So, but the fact of the matter remains, that's sort of Ng's theorem. We just have a kind of nice um, alternative proof to it. So uh, I think I am now over time. So um, I'm not in Virginia. I'm in Ontario. So I guess as sort of is the, the, the tradition around here, I'll do the, the land acknowledgement. So uh, I actually live in the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe and the neutral peoples. Also, the most of the city of Waterloo is actually built in the Haldeman Track, which was promised by the crown to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations. And well, lots of us non Haudenosaunee seem to live here now, so it is what it is. But, uh, you know, I think we have to make peace with our history in this part of the world as well. So I thank you all. Thanks, Nico. It was a nice talk. Uh, it was actually one of those instances in which was good. You are not giving a talk presently, because as Ben and I just experienced right now, uh, there are hard, horrible constructions happening in the department. <laughs> so ah. we just had like 40 minutes of our heads inside of a blender. <laughs> They're well, destroying very... the bathroom next door. So last summer, I was prepared to give a talk in this sort of Brazos Valley seminar, and I was just starting to go. And right across the street from me, someone starts using a hammer drill. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> I had to run inside my house. <laughs> no, the, the guys started literally when you started and they stopped oh, 10 no. minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they- They, they didn't they, stop. They haven't stopped. Uh, they have they got to keep on going? I, I don't, I'm not hearing- They're still anything. going. Yeah, they're still yeah. going. Yeah. yeah, but Ben's office is even closer to them, so I think he, he had an even better time. I have to give a virtual talk in a couple of weeks, and we'll see how that goes. But anyway, so uh, sorry. So, do we have any questions for Nico? And thanks for your talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, I was wondering about this. Uh, so, this you said the maximal almost periodic implies residually sin. Um, is it possible just to do this from like like the Peter Vial theorem or something like this? Um, like just using the you can separate points in the compact group by representations in matrix yeah, algebra. Okay, I guess the type of example that we might want to look at this is the following. So let's let's consider a two element group um, acting non-trivial on integers and sort of build this kind of construction of Murakami's. Yeah. Um, so this particular thing here, so it's easy to see that um, if, if I build, um, so keep in mind, this is of course a uh, pro-finite compact group, right? In an obvious way. And, and as such, this, this whole semi-direct product construction is evidently 
pro discrete, which is maybe even a bit more powerful than being um, residually small invariant neighborhood. Um, so this, this is certainly a maximally almost periodic group. Um, not that I know off the top of my head how to write down its compactification. What is the, what is the compact group it embeds into? It's probably an easy exercise. Or I just haven't done it. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a famous example of a maximally almost periodic group that's not sin. So I guess if one was to answer this question, one might maybe try to look at applying this technology to this, this given example here. Um, now, I think that being said, um, if I sort of try the, the proof that I'm trying to hint at over here on a totally disconnected group, I think it does make our life quite a bit easier. I think having to sort of fool around a little bit with this kernel is what gave the slight bit of difficulty in this proof. I'm not gonna say this is the deepest idea a human being has ever had, but it, it took me a little while, so. I see, I see, okay, thanks. Do you have any other questions, Tadiko? Well, if you have no other questions, then just thank you again. Thanks, Nico, for the nice talk. Well, thank you. Uh, I uh, stopped the share. Oh, yeah, and I should stop the okay. recording. <laughs>